this is Joseph Clare, and you're listening to George Fox Talks Theology. Hey, welcome. Welcome, everyone, to George Fox Talks Theology. I'm your host, Joseph Clare, and it's a pleasure to be back with you today. It's a very special day. Very, very excited to guests who are, are prayer pros. I have pros at prayer. Well, actually, I don't know if they, I don't know if they're good at praying, but they think they've thought about it. I have a philosopher of prayer and a theologian of prayer. It's amazing gift. Uh, George Fox Professor Isaac Choi, director of the honors program, professor of philosophy here with us a man who has studied at all the illustrious places from Harvard to Notre Dame and and been a gift to this community. Lindsay Hankins, brand new, fresh here, mm-hmm. uh, professor of theology um, from Princeton Theological Seminary, mm-hmm. both of whom have written about prayer from an academic perspective in philosophy and theology. And so we'll dive in to that. But really, this is a conversation about prayer. So let's begin here. I've been wanting to know this. In fact, I just thought of it as I was walking <laughs> over. Is there anything that you shouldn't pray for? As a Christian. Yeah. You know, I got into argument about this with someone. Um, I was at a different round table at one point and I was talking about like, I I think I said something about bad prayers Mm. and this woman stopped me. She goes, there are no bad prayers. And this idea, I think what she's getting at is like, we should talk to God and we can come to God with Mm. what Mm -hmm. we really want to, what we need, what we're, you know, have in front of us and what's on our heart. On the other hand, you know, I was just, Literally today, in my ethics class, we're talking about this book by Lauren Winter, where she talks about the dangers of Christian practice. Mm -hmm. And she has this chapter on prayer, and she goes to these journals of these antebellum South um, journals of these women. And this woman in there prays for perseverance to better beat her slave. Mm. That's bad. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point, you can say that that's not a prayer, that that's just ill wishing, Mm. right? Like it's such a deformed ask Mm. that it just undercuts the definition of what we'd want to call prayer. So yeah. Unless, unless maybe she was having trouble persevering because she had moral qualms about the act. Right. And then it's no, like, she wanted oh, perseverance she, okay. so that she could. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which just, Oh man. It's yeah. the bad way. Is it's it? the, it's what about the, the bad philosopher? Way? They're bad. Well, I, I mean, maybe I'm going to go biblical with this, right? Okay. Because, oh, because, <laughs> yeah, that's like the Good opposite card. direction. Right. But like, you know, James, right. He talks about yes. like, God doesn't hear your prayers because you want them to spend them on your selfish desires. Yeah. Mm. Right. So I think that would be very much aligned with the antebellum South example yeah. in which she wants this prayer to be answered just because her own, you know, ego in terms of her power mm. over the slave, whatever it might be as opposed to desiring something good from God, as opposed to, you know, what she wants, right? So I think even from the biblical witness, there's this mm-hmm. idea that prayers that are motivated by a bad desire right. are prayers that God will not answer. And there's also, you know, in James famously, there's this connection between faith and works, mm-hmm. which like kind of, the, I always call it like the mic drop moment. There's Gregory of Nyssa has a lot of mic drop moments, but one of his, he has this, um, he's giving a sermon on the Lord's Prayer and he does this incredible thing where he is, he's giving this homily, right, to his congregation. He's saying, you're asking that God forgive your debtors, but your debtor is in prison right now. And he's going on and on, like, you do, you're asking mm-hmm. for this, but this is happening. Mm-hmm. You're asking for this, but this is happening. Mm-hmm. And his mic drop, ancient mic drop, he says, God <laughs> can't hear your prayers because mm-hmm. the cry of the one whose neck you're standing on is drowning it out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this idea that like, wow. Um, yes, like there's this, the bad asking. Yeah. And then the, mm-hmm. also like you ask uh, the context and the, the context of your life and the action surrounding and the way that you've chosen to show and withhold the love around you. Like that, these things actually matter too, that oh, yeah. there's a context for prayer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, absolutely. That reminds me of Isaiah where it's like, you know, I can't even hear your prayers because of the bloodshed yes, that's on your exactly. hands. Yeah, yeah. It's very much this yeah, yeah. biblical theme. But I think it's interesting because I think it's not just the objects that can sometimes be bad, like beating your slave, but even like the pastor who prays, God, let me preach like this powerful sermon. If it's asked out of like this desire for, you know, self-glorification mm-hmm. as opposed to how can I best serve my flock? How can I best serve the kingdom of God? That too, I think God would not answer, even though that's a good thing, right? That a sermon is preached powerfully and well, Mm. but if it's motivated by this desire for the self, I think that also is along the same lines of what James says. God's not going to listen to that because it's not for something that is ultimately good, right? Mm -hmm. You're 
your intention is not for something that um, either honors God or loves others. It's purely self-motivated. So God yeah. won't hear or can't hear or won't answer mm. misdirected or bad asks. Are there examples though? And I was trying to come up with one, but you know, the Bible better than I do. I think Isaac, like, no, <laughs> that's not are true. There, no, are there <laughs> examples though, where God begrudgingly or even like judgmentally does answer the bad ask uh, mm. or the selfish desire uh, prayer in the Bible or in Christian history? I'm trying to think of an example the bad podcast question of everyone. Goes I mean, silent. certainly in the, among the ancient Greeks, the pagan Greeks, they thought, you know, it's like God's going to punish their gods are going to punish those that they hate by answering their bad prayers. Right. Right. So there's yeah, this yeah. kind of like spitefulness among the kind of Olympian gods um, of yeah. answered prayers being a punishment. But I, I don't know. Well, if we have this comes image in scripture, right. Of like he- heaping coals. Ah. Right. Uh, you know, I I'm not, Nothing immediately comes to mind in the sense of God answering a bad prayer for the way that it would be like a basically educational. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Here you go. Um, but we also, you, want that. Yeah. you know, I think one of the least preached upon texts ever has to be that Canaanite mother in Matthew 15, right? Mm. Where she approaches Jesus and is like, please come help my daughter. And he ignores her. And then she's like, no, but seriously, please come help my daughter. And then he calls her a dog. And then mm. she's like, no, okay, but please. Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> and then he I'm says, oh, the you have great faith. Mm. Like, so that's a, or the persistent judge. Like there's like these mm-hmm. images of, mm-hmm. of God answering in a way that doesn't seem typical mm-hmm. or doesn't even seem kind, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like yeah. that it ultimately, it, there's a, there's a wildness and a strangeness mm-hmm. to sometimes of yeah, how God yeah. answers. But I can't think of an image of that initial question. Yeah, I don't know. I was trying to think of, I was thinking like the life of David or Saul or something where it's like. God kind of gave well, you them know, what they wanted, and it was like, oops, yeah. you didn't want that, actually. I mean, maybe the Israelites asking for a king, right? Ah, the, the, okay. The, yeah, Saul, yeah, that's a great go. one. I don't know if it came exactly in the form of utterance, but it was a desire. So I do think God seemingly gives um, things to people, even if the desire is misdirected, yeah. not always clearly as judgment. Well, or, God gives good things. Good things, yeah. Right? Like that's what he doesn't give a stone, right? Like that what God gives is good. But that's the king. That's why that's puzzling, though, is it's like, is it good that they had a king? The other mm-hmm. nations had a king. I don't know. Rabbit trail. But back to the point. That's this canalog- podcast that's is good. <laughs> theolo- <laughs> so this podcast premise is that there's a theology of everything. George Fox talks theology. So even in a secular, non-religious age or context, there's really because as Christians, we believe God is the creator of everyone and everything. There's mm-hmm. a theology of everything ultimately. And so we've played with that around science and some surprising things. It should be no surprise to anyone that there's a theology of prayer, probably talking to God, but let's begin at the beginning. Let's get really basic. What in the world are we talking about when we talk about prayer? We've kind of mm-hmm. been talking about like asking for things from this like supernatural power or being, or like, what would yeah. you, how would you answer that? If someone just said, Hey, what's prayer? Uh, well, I mean, I would, I would characterize that as like conversing with God, mm. like having a conversation with God. Right. And, and, you know, in our conversations, we, we have all kinds of different purposes in our conversations. Sometimes it's because, you know, I want to go to my boss and get a raise or something like that. And that's an ask, right? But sometimes it's like, I have a <laughs> conversation. That a specific no, no, no. Right I mean, yeah, it's purely yeah. hypothetical. I'm just yeah, dropping exactly. some. In a different <laughs> time. A different in a different era. place, yeah, in a different exactly. context. But also other times we, we just want to um, apologize. Maybe I want to, you know, have a conversation with, with, with my wife because maybe I've slighted her in some way and mm. I want to apologize to her. Or, or maybe uh, I want to take someone out um, and celebrate some uh, a, a, a accomplishment or some way mm-hmm. that um, uh, something that's good that's happened in their life. And so that I think we have many different kind of contexts and purposes for which we have conversations with other people. And I think mm-hmm. in a similar way, like we can have prayers of petition or prayers of thanksgiving or prayers of confession, mm-hmm. um, all these different ways in which we converse with each other. We can also converse with God. I don't know. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? As, yeah, at least I, as a first draft. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I mean, I think... Right. So how do you answer this? What do you think prayer is? And what does the tradition say what prayer yeah, is? And what so-and-so say both. prayer is? Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, traditionally, there is a, a pronounced recurring inflection on this idea of prayer as conversation. I think it it is one of these, it's a conversation that typically takes the form of petition. Mm. But it can and often really does take the form of lament, mm-hmm. of protest, mm-hmm. of sort of... of of meditation, contemplation, like there are, 
other forms that mm-hmm. that conversation takes of that abidingness of prayer uh, mm-hmm. that takes the conversational form or a, uh, the abidingness of our relationship with God that in prayer takes the form of conversation. But I think kind of the recurring major key is mm-hmm. often more of this petition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where mm-hmm. I'm ask I'm asking and, yeah. and not in small part because when Jesus said, this is how you pray, yeah. it was a series of petitions, mm-hmm. claims right. of who, a recognition of who it is you're talking to and then a series of asks. Yep. Makes sense. So at its basic, I think most, the lion's share of the Christian tradition around the world and throughout the ages would say it's something like those three forms of prayer. The Psalms seem to right. exemplify all of them. You're asking, you're petitioning things of God. You're praising. You're praising, right. which would go in the the lines probably of thanksgiving, gratitude, yep. recognition of who God is. And then there's this other form of reckoning with your moral guilt before God, confessing your sins, repenting, trying to turn Mm -hmm. from them. Um, But when you think of it in the popular imagination, as we sort of began, petition is really the Mm. thing, right? Mm -hmm. You're asking God for things. And I would, I don't know what the percentage of biblical prayers ends up being petitions, but a lot of them, right? That's kind of unique to the Christian faith. It's very different than other world religious traditions where you're trying like to come to grips with this metaphysical reality, which is in stoicism or Buddhism. Um, there's, there's something about this personal God in Judaism and Christianity in this personal God who interacts directly with humanity in like very specific ways and events and actions that makes Christianity like feel really, um, really oriented toward petitioning God mm-hmm. for things. Right. Mm-hmm. That seems awesome. It also seems like, a liability in certain ways. So trying to figure out what do you why, mean liability? Well, that's, that's what I'm want to figure out with you. Is it a liability or, um, this is something I know Isaac has written about and I'm interested to know is how do you, so let's just take my own life. For example, I have asked God for many things. <laughs> Some of those things seem to have been given, yeah. um, or answered, whatever the answer might be. And many of them <laughs> seem right. to have gone unanswered or unnoticed or, yeah rejected, uh, you know, send yeah. back, return to sender. I don't know. So what, it's like a beautiful thing that you have a conversation with God, including expressing your desire and wishes and will for the world. But is it also like a weakness or a liability or a vulnerability for Christian faith? How do you answer that? I think there's definitely this uh, possibility of vulnerability because I've read many kind of uh, <laughs> biographies of atheists who said, you know, I used to believe in God, but then I asked for this one big thing, mm. like, you know, that my parents won't get divorced or, you know, something like that. Right. And they got divorced. And so that yeah. made me realize God doesn't exist. And so therefore I rejected my childhood faith. And mm. so I've seen that over and over again. So I think it is a liability in that sense that there's this possibility that we take a given unanswered prayer mm. and we just say, okay, I'm going to throw it all, the, all out the window. Mm. Um, and so I think that that becomes this at least, even if it's not rejection of the faith, it sure. becomes a, a an avenue for serious doubt to I, enter. I don't think I really ever thought about that vulnerability until I had kids. Mm. Like I know I'd mm-hmm. read, you know, the atheist, you know, accounts that you're talking about, but it didn't really matter to me until I had my kids, yep. and I started noticing my prayers at the dinner table mm. and just trying to figure out, like, how do I balance a kind of like affirming, faithful, like asking God, you know, for big things or any things and, and believing, you know, it Mm -hmm. seems like Jesus uses it over and over. Like you asked me for this, I'm going to do it for you. Your faith has made you well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you Mm -hmm. believed, you moved the mountain, you threw it in the sea, you know, like it's all there in scripture, but I'm praying with my kids. I remember a few summers ago, we had this beloved friend and getting later in life and longing for a spouse. And Mm -hmm. we started praying every evening in this beautiful connected way to this person. And I'm just like, going through my mind like month after month being like, what about if this spouse doesn't materialize, you know, like what I don't, that conversation with my kids. And of course I'm, I'm theological enough to know, well, that will get to that next phase of why God does and doesn't answer. Mm -hmm. But I'm also like, or we're praying for my wife's cousin who had cancer Mm -hmm. and believing, you know, and, um, but I'm also like, shoot, I don't want to set them up for a shipwreck later when these things like don't get answered. So I don't know. How do you wrestle with that? Dr. Ankins? Well, you know, we shouldn't go too far without referencing C.S. Lewis, right? So, so <laughs> not on this podcast. Not on this you podcast. <laughs> not on my time. Perfect timing. No, so he, you know, he wrote this great book, um, Letters to Malcolm, mm. chiefly on prayer. Mm. One thing to note about writing about prayer, which is something maybe we should have taken more seriously, is that the people who do it best usually write at the end of their lives, <laughs> um, which is something I knew on the front end, but still, you know, moved ahead. But Lewis 
picked up, he started writing this book on prayer and put it down. Mm. And it actually is one of his final written works. He picked Mm. up at the very end of his life. It's one of his most mature writings. And I'm told by a Lewis expert, this is not something I currently did actually do research on, but someone who does know Lewis told me this, that what tore him up and what eventually brought him to like this impasse that he had to set the project down was that he was looking at this biblical witness. He's looking at his own life of prayer. And he's recognizing that on one hand, God is admonishing him, is, is recommending to him to pray boldly. Ask, seek, knock, mm-hmm. you know, ask, and it will be given. And so there's this boldness, right, to prayer. Ask big. Mm-hmm. And there's this submission. Mm-hmm. There's this, not even just recommendation, a, you are, you need to pray in such a way that your will be done, not mine. Mm-hmm. So how on earth... Is it that you pray both Mm. boldly Mm -hmm. and with wild submission at the same time and not be a liar on one of those ends? And it just tore Lewis up. And so he ended up having to, he just set it down, did his other great work, (laughs) Mm -hmm. came back to it later in life. And, you know, I'll go read the book to find his answer. But (laughs) there's Mm -hmm. prayer is like so many other basics of the Christian faith in the sense that is wildly simple and easy. Mm-hmm. My four-year-old really does pray. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're beautiful. They're weird, mm-hmm. but they're beautiful. Mm-hmm. And prayer is something that the greatest minds, the greatest people of faith will struggle their entire lives with and mm-hmm. will never know the depths of in their practices. So I don't, I'm like nervous to resolve it, but I, you know, there's this my own background with prayer is I spent a lot of time with Thomas Aquinas on the topic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great medieval theologian. The Great Christian medieval tradition. theologian. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and he, one of the things I like most about Thomas is how generous he is with the people he likes to talk with. Mm. And so he's drawing on Augustine. He's drawing on all these folks just trying to think about prayer. And he gets to this prayer in Gethsemane of Jesus, this take this cup for me. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I think the worst way of looking at that scene in scripture mm, is to think mm-hmm. that like Jesus didn't really mean it. Mm-hmm. That he's like putting on the show for us. Of, like, mm. you want to know what holiness looks like? Yeah. Check this out. <laughs> you know, like right. that he's like putting on this great pantomime yeah. of what it means to be human. Mm. And Thomas has this kind of, you know, wild for him take on it, which is that, that Christ prayed out of his, he says in his Thomas's world, out of his sensuality when he prayed, that he really, he meant it when he said, take this cup from me. Mm -hmm. He offered up the desires he actually had. I don't want to be tortured Mm -hmm. and abused. Take this cup from me, please. Mm -hmm. That that wasn't a, a show that was real. But not only did he offer up his actual desires as they stand, Mm. he also offered up his entire will. So in prayer, we pray boldly because not only are we asking for the things we actually want, we also pray at the same time submissively because we say my entire life, everything I am is yours. Mm. And so you get to actually do both, but it takes a lot of practice to be able to do both of those up and running. And Mm -hmm. and on any given day, depending on how hungry I am, Mm -hmm. depending on how other things are going, I may not be able to manage both, but Mm. that's the, Mm -hmm. that's the hope, right? Is that you'd be able to do doing that yeah mm-hmm. not just the desire but the will itself yeah wow what do you think about that yeah Isaac? so it's actually interesting in the philosophical side of things there's this puzzle about prayer mm. right and this is in the literature if god knows better than all of us what's best for us why are we actually even asking him for anything right mm-hmm. if i say yeah. i want this job lord please give me this job or um please give this person a spouse or something like that mm-hmm. if god's not giving that person that job or that spouse it's presumably because God knows better than us. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's we, prayer is weird in that we are asking for things that God hasn't done in those situations. And you would think that if those things that we're asking for are actually the best, then God would have already done those things. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's this big puzzle there, right? Mm-hmm. So you might think that God should not answer almost any of our prayers because he'll always know better than us. Mm. Right. So this is a philosophical puzzle, right? And <laughs> a theological puzzle too. But I think what's really interesting is that um, I think... Uh, we all have those examples in our lives, or maybe not all of us, but at least I have certain examples in my life when I think about their prayers. Their, their prayers are super powerful and effective, right? Whatever they pray for, almost it always happens, right? Mm. And it's, I don't think it's because God loves them more or anything like that. 
my theory is, or my view on this is that um, their wills and hearts have become so aligned with God mm -hmm. that they can look into a situation and see what God would want in that situation mm. and see what would be the best. You know, there's this language in 1 Corinthians that we have the mind of Christ, that in some sense they've taken on the mind of Christ in a certain kind of mm. way that they can ask for the things that are in alignment with God's will, what he sees as best. And so I think that's the reason why folks who are older, further along mm. in, the, in the life of faith, mm. actually are more effective in their prayer. And maybe that's why they have more insight in their prayer, because I think they potentially also children. <laughs> Uh, yeah, children as well, right? Yeah. Because maybe they haven't been tainted as much by the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there there is this issue of alignment, right? Because if if our wills and our desires are so kind of opposite or in conflict with what God sees as best sure. in the world, yeah. then you're going to imagine that most of our prayers are not going to be answered. Mm. Whereas it's like, if our prayer is that submission, uh, is out of that spirit of submission, not just that whatever happens, happens like that kind of fatalistic submission, but more submission like, I want your will to be done. I mean, that is from the Lord's Prayer, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I want your will to be done. Align my heart and my desires and even my requests yeah. to be aligned with what you see as best. That and let solves. me pray those prayers. Um, let, me, let me pray um, your will through my prayers, right? Let me so. pray your will through my prayers. Yes, alignment for me solves like maybe 50 to 75% of the problems, which are most of my prayers, which is, Lord... Don't I deserve a bigger boat than the one I have? <laughs> like I love this boat, but it's too small, and I want a bigger motor and all this. Um, so that those are alignment issues, probably. I don't need a bigger boat. But when your kid is like crying out for yeah. their parents' cancer to be healed, mm. Um, mm. and yeah. it's ostensibly not being answered, I'm like, what could they possibly be doing in misalignment with mm. God's will? And mm -hmm. why wouldn't he answer? Right. So you still have the this remainder of sort of prayers that go unanswered that seem problematic for the faith mm -hmm. of the atheist, mm -hmm. you know, in their adult life or whatever. Yeah. A few things. One, there's good and bad answers to give when we get to the question of like, why does God not answer prayers? Sometimes it's because you're just asking for stupid and bad things, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Like that's pretty simple. That dispenses with a decent amount. Sometimes you're asking for really good things, but it's just not the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And if God God actually, if God is God, mm -hmm. <laughs> then he would know the right timing of a given good, right? And so, you know, hey, not it's not a bad thing, but it's not the right time. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of easier answers, right? The harder ones, well, one is one is this, and this is something I, I've, I've talked to students about um, in the past, is to say, one bad answer that I think we need to get away from pretty quickly is this idea that I, I, I hear really commonly in Christian circles with this idea of like everything happens for a reason. Why didn't mm -hmm. God answer that? Because everything happens for a reason. He just, it's like this, it's generally meant to be comforting. Mm -hmm. Like God's in control. He hasn't forgotten about you. Everything happens for a reason. It's really dangerous though. It's really dangerous because there is a phenomenally important distinction between it's inconvenient that this thing didn't happen and I wanted it to, and that it is unjust. It is horrific mm -hmm. that this thing happened. Everything can't happen for a reason because some things are damnable, <laughs> because some things are horrible, because the problem of evil in the end really is a problem, mm -hmm. because some things are just things that God will say in the end of times. I, I damn like this. It's damnable. That mm -hmm. was a horrible thing. So some things ha sometimes God doesn't answer prayers, and we really don't have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. Period. And sometimes, so that's just, and that's a, actually a decent category, mm -hmm. right? Like, why are there children in cages? Mm -hmm. Why are there children washing up on shores? The, the silence. That's the response. Mm. Silence and yeah, um, lamentation. But, but. One of the things that has been really moving to me, Thomas again, a little <laughs> bit of Augustine in there. Augustine actually has this great sermon. Yes, he does. Right? Do you know this one I'm talking no, about? No, but they're all great. They're all great. <laughs> yeah. This is on First John, and he's talking about this. He's talking about why we persist in prayer, mm -hmm. and which we're told everywhere to do throughout Scripture, right? Yep. Seems like, you know, under, repetition is like the ancient world's way of underlining. <laughs> <laughs> so if it happens mm -hmm. all the time in Scripture, probably a good thing to pay attention. So why persevere? Why, Augustine says, because... The longing, the prolonged longing, he says, mm -hmm. it's like our hearts are like wineskins and they get stretched mm -hmm. in that longing, in that persistent longing, such that we actually have a capacity for love mm -hmm. that we didn't have before. So yep. why does God delay 
Some, why does he not answer? Because mm-hmm. he's delaying. Mm-hmm. Because he's actually, and it's horrible and annoying, but he's breaking you into this new creation. He's mm-hmm. stretching your heart. He's stretching your passions so mm-hmm. that you can actually, honestly, you have the capacity for love that he has next for you. I mean, mm-hmm. I, why does God delay sometimes? For that reason. He has more in store for you than you can, han- than you can handle right now. Yeah. No, it's be- the soul stretching elements of prayer or delayed uh, response from God are, um, I love that image but of I do the think stretch wine skin. It, it's just a, in life, wisdom as a theologian is knowing that you can't pull the mystery card too quickly, mm-hmm. but that sometimes you need to. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Like that. Why but, doesn't God answer? Because silence. Silence. I wonder though, I mean, those issues you're bringing up that are damnable and just the horrendous, it's like Brothers Karamazov, Ivan, Grand Inquisitor kind of stuff of um, children being abused and beaten. It just mm-hmm. seems to be the one that just strikes the like chord of chords of like, what in the world got? So not only you don't even need to be a prayer or a religious person to be mad about that, even if you just think there's a God and you think that's being allowed to happen. It just seems like it's doubled down on, he's not only allowing it, but people are like directly pleading with him right. to make it stop and he's not acting. This mm-hmm. does get into really big questions about God's activity in the world and predestining events or allowing evil to happen. And and that touches on prayer big time. I don't know, Mm -hmm. Isaac, if you have a thought on that. Yeah. I mean, I think this is where um, this question of prayer and unanswered prayer becomes just one subsection of the problem of evil, Mm -hmm. you know, which is this massive, huge theological philosophical topic. And so obviously we can't go into that all fully, and it's interesting because I, I have colleagues in philosophy who actually reject the whole idea of petitionary prayer because they think it yeah. makes the problem of evil mm-hmm. worse, mm-hmm. right? Because if God answers certain prayers and but then others. doesn't answer in these horrific situations, right. that just makes it worse. Whereas if you say God's just going to be a deistic God, he's just kind of watching us from a distance, and then it's like that's his policy and he's just yeah. not going to answer any prayers. Yeah. Whereas you know, if you if you start saying, "Oh, God answers certain prayers, but not other ones," that's like, "Why, God? Why?" Right? Mm-hmm. That I think mm-hmm. that that the cry of our hearts comes forward. Um, but I do think that as a Christian, like the consistent biblical witness is, yes, God does answer prayers. He actually does answer some of them, but at the same time holding that He does allow horrific evil in the mm-hmm. world, right? And you know, maybe we do have to avert to mystery at some point. Um, in philosophy, this this is a view called skeptical theism, not not skeptical of theism, but skeptical of our ability to be able to understand why God would allow that kind of thing, right? right. Because if God doesn't tell us why, like it's going to be very unlikely that we could figure it out, right? That kind of idea. It brings up the idea of how eschatology, right. the, the end, the healing and redeeming and reconciling and recreation of all things somehow factors into our sense of prayers being answered. Eschatology and ecclesiology. Like another yeah. way that Thomas is great on this topic, and he's talking, so he's talking about this Canaanite mother, right? He's talking about why all these reasons why Jesus might delay, mm-hmm. not answer her prayer, mm-hmm. right? It's a good prayer. Help my daughter. Right. Why doesn't he answer? One of the reasons that Thomas gives is that Jesus doesn't immediately respond because it's a test of faith, but it's not a test for her. Because mm-hmm. later on he says, right, you have great faith. It's a test for the disciples who are standing on the sidelines just watching this all happen. And they fail. Mm. Jesus was delaying so that the church would act like it. So that these brothers, these disciples mm. would come to the aid of this woman and they don't. So there's a sense of, and again, this doesn't cover everything, but why does God delay? Because we are partners in God's providential plan as a body. And there are things that Joseph can do for me, that Isaac can do for me. I don't need to ask God for this help because you guys could provide it. Mm -hmm. And you just need to show up, right? Like this is part of what it means to be the body is to be people who are actually the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So we can and should ask for big and bad and bold things, Mm -hmm. not bad, big and bold (laughs) things from God. But we also need to fundamentally ask each other. Like that petition Mm -hmm. works on this plane too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. No, exactly. I think the sense in which God will ultimately answer some of these prayers, but not in this life, um, or he is answering them maybe through the means of other people and community through the body of Christ, through the church. Um, brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky thought more deeply about this than I think anyone else, um, or as deeply as anyone else. And it seems like the conclusion 
um, to this question, maybe not so much about prayer, but just the existence of the pro- of evil in really like horrendous cases, damnable things, children suffering, is that somehow God's redeeming activity at the end of all time will be so just and stunningly beautiful and healing and true and right that it will make sense of how he somehow allowed this to happen. Because if you go the other direction, you're saying he's actually powerless and all this stuff is just happening outside of his will. It gets into this really sticky sort of question of God's divine agency with evil, um, which we're not going to unpack today. But I remember, you know, Isaac, our friend who we lost this summer, Javier Garcia, Mm -hmm. Uh, running the honors program before you, such a beautiful soul, great theologian. Six days before he passed away, he gave this amazing commencement address to a high school graduation in Portland. And he just said the good life is um, uh, to learn well, uh, to love well, to suffer well. And it was that vision um, of of Dostoevsky and somehow God being with us in yeah. the suffering and in the incarnation, the crucified God, you know, which his uh, Javier's theological hero Bonhoeffer made a great deal of in his own suffering Um, that, that, that is the mystery. And I think back to Augustine. um, So Augustine calls the body of when he, when he speaks of the body of Christ in his sermons, especially in the Psalms, he speaks of the whole Christ, the totus Christus in Latin. And so he says, if you're ever talking about the body of Christ, you're talking about the head who's Mm -hmm. in heaven ascended, Mm -hmm. sitting at the right hand of the father praying for us. But you're also talking about the body, which in his trans temporal kind of time meets eternity way is like us down here in the flesh, still somehow on the cross. So he almost sees like the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension as in this like simultaneity somehow in the eternally places. So we're kind of down here still feeling like we're on the cross, even though the head's in glory. And it's in that tension that we are still living out the garden of Gethsemane prayer in Augustine's mind. So he actually thinks like, to your point, that was actually, you helped me understand. I don't think I ever understood what he was saying, but he's saying Christ so united the human and divine natures in one person. When he cried out in the garden of Eden, let this cup pass from me. Garden of Golgotha. Garden of different garden. Yeah, oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Outside the flaming swords, Gethsemane. Yeah, Gethsemane. So when he cries out, let this cup pass, take this cup from me. That's the true cry of his yeah. human nature, the human nature in all of us, which is to avoid evil and suffering and to pursue happiness and goodness and flourishing and well-being, not being crucified on a cross. Right. And so yeah, it's if you have a choice, prayer. I'd rather not be crucified on a not. cross. Exactly. But taking that desire and submitting it to God in a way no other human being could. And so this is where Augustine would even distinguish him from any other human, including Mary, of like he was able to submit the human will to God when he said, yet not my will be done, but your will. Um, that that was like a that was a healing and transformation of the human will of his his two natures in a way that we can inherit by being joined to Christ and having the mind of Christ. It's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. So you're doing that both and prayer um, at the same time, which is really hard to do, but it does change it when you think that it is Christ, the one who was crucified, raised and ascended, praying this through you, this doubled both and sort of, here's what I really want, but here's my full submission to you. And I actually couldn't do that in my human nature apart from the grace, you know, which comes to us through the spirit and the risen Christ being in us. So that's a big theological uh, sort of like summary of a lot of material, but I think it, it highlights a lot of our prayers are reduced down to um, the gimme. So that's like a, mm-hmm. one of my favorite books of all time, classic, great work should be in our honors program. The gimme's the Bernstein bears where the kids just start <laughs> asking, asking for, for things. And I do think that's 99.9% mm-hmm. of my prayers, but um, to Augustine again, people are noticing a thread on this podcast that our friend <laughs> Augustine comes back. My favorite thing written by Augustine is letter 130, which he wrote to on a, what, prayer, on, on proba, on to proba, proba yeah. yeah. The widow, which Aquinas knew was very important. Yeah. Everyone knew it's beautiful. And he says, well, what do you, she's like, how do I pray? He's like, well, first you got to think about what you're praying for. And he said, let me assure you, this is basically what every human beings pray for all the elements and ingredients that lead to a happy life, a flourishing yeah. life. Like you want things to go well for your two kids, Isaac, and your two kids. And you want things to go well in the world. And for others, you don't want sickness. You want health. You don't want pain. You want, you know, just like go down the list of mm-hmm. what you think makes for happy, enjoyable, flourishing, going well life. And that's what you're asking for. And yet 
you're bringing it to God, which is entering it into a totally different dimension in which you're, you're willing to be thwarted and willing to have your conception of what the good going happy life looks like change, transformed, reoriented, stretched out, you know, and it's that sort of back and forth of prayer in which your, your own conception of yourself and your good life is actually fundamentally being not called into question, but opened up to an authorship from God, which is kind of outside your control. So that's the relinquishing of the will, um, as I would, as I would think of it. Well, the one thing I would, I would want to highlight at this point is yes. <laughs> right? So I, yes. You have to that, say yes. That, You're on my I, podcast. <laughs> yeah. that, yes. We, in so many ways in prayer, is prayer is a, a way that we conform ourselves to the life of Christ. Another way, a really important corrective, or maybe not even corrective, but an additional advantage on that, is that there are some of us who have to f- seek a kind of good suffering mm. so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ, and prayer is a vehicle for that. And there are some of us who have been put in positions of great suffering, and we just are the face of Christ. Mm. Right? That there's so much, there is this sh- crazy image in Matthew 25 of, right? Like, you want to know where I am? I'm in the poor. Mm. I'm in the people in prison. Did you come visit me? I'm the naked. Did you clothe me? You want to see my face? I'm that hungry person in front of you. Mm. Those who are crying out, not because they're looking to be conformed to Christ, but because something about their situation Mm -hmm. is the the injustice of their situation is such that they are crucified Christ's. Mm. Right, that there's also something about those prayers that mm. we need to hear. Right, that the, of the prayers that come when you don't seek out suffering, but it's already found you, mm. and a suffering that is unjust. Right, mm. that th- those are that's a different kind of form of. I fundamentally orientate. I, I am. I am in this picture that you just painted, because in general. Mm-hmm. There's actually quite a bit of promise in my life. And I need to work against how easy some elements of my life are so that I can find the face of Christ. Mm-hmm. And there are too many people for too long. That's just not a possibility. Mm-hmm. And they also have a lot to teach us about prayer. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's good. I, I think... In the tradition of thinking about prayer in the church, the Psalms have always played a central yeah. role. They're the songs, the poems, the prayers of the people of God, Israel, and the church. And there's some pretty painful prayers in there that are not just about like, hey, help me be less selfish, you know, or have yeah. a more refined picture of my life going well, but are about just complaint, dereliction. Mm-hmm. Just or is it Psalm 88 that's just like, yeah, throw no it on way. the ground? Throw it on the ground. It's over. It's darkness, my old yeah. friend. It's Simon and Garfunkel. And I think, <laughs> and Psalm 88 and Psalm 22 might yeah, be yeah. rivals for the darkest yeah. deal. So what does Jesus could go to in his mm-hmm. moment of total dereliction. Psalm 22 verse one, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think that's exactly right is that the prayers of God's people range from complaint and lament to elation and thanksgiving and yeah. gratitude and petition. And those prayers have been in the throats of God's people for ages. They were in the throat of Jesus yeah, and in because some way, they were first in the throat of Jesus. Exactly. Yeah. And in some way, they're still, the throat of Jesus is still praying them insofar as we are the body of Christ, yeah. we're the people of God. And so I think you're right. The more you can actually not just get in touch with the Psalms, but be like horizontally around people for whom those are real prayers and real complaints and real lamentations, the more likely it's going to be the throat of Jesus in your throat, praying those, you know, to the Father. I mean, that's that mystery of the whole Christ that I think Augustine was alluding to. Carl Barth has this kind of crazy cosmic cruciform vision of prayer where he talks about prayer as actually what constitutes the person of Christ, Mm -hmm. that um, prayer is what makes Christ human. Mm -hmm. It's this perfect, perfect dependence on the spirit to conform to the will of the father. And so insofar as Christ does that perfectly, he's the perfect human, which is to say that when we pray in that perfect, complete dependence on the spirit, 
lead me. I'm lost. Mm -hmm. I give this up to you. That that's actually when we become most human, according to Bart. Mm. That the perfection of prayer is actually the perfection of what it means to be human. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because that brings to mind Hebrews where it talks about Christ is interceding for us. Yeah. Um, to to the God the Father. So it's like even in his um after his death and resurrection, he's still in that role of prayer, but for us. So like that kind of cosmic intercession within the Godhead is going on even now. So and lest you not know, you know how to pray for what you need in Romans 8. Yeah, in, in our, the Spirit. Yeah, right? the Spirit groans right. in our groaning. The Spirit's praying for us. Hmm. The challenge of unanswered prayer seems manifold. It just seems like a perfect, like, you know, theological pickle can shipwreck your faith. Like, I asked for this big thing that meant mm -hmm. a lot to me. I don't think I was mm -hmm. being selfish. God didn't answer it. Yeah. Answered prayer, I feel like, can be a challenge. So fast forward from praying around the dinner table with our friend to being at her wedding a couple weeks mm -hmm. ago with our kids and rejoicing mm -hmm. in, with her and mm -hmm. then God's answer to her prayer and the longing of her heart for, you know, four decades. Um, and then in that, yeah, I mean, I don't, I didn't, dampen the enthusiasm or even think this thought then, but I now am, Hey, by the way, you know, I don't know if this was an answer to prayer because many people have prayed for spouses and God sure. didn't answer, but that sure. was the thought as I was looking at my kids rejoicing with them and highlighting for them the way God had heard our cry, had mm -hmm. heard her cry. And this is a beautiful thing thinking, yeah, the collateral, the other side, the consequence of that is what about the unanswered versions mm -hmm. of that? And I guess that just speaks to, if you go totally theoretical and abstract about this of like why he answered this and not that, or why that went unanswered, you run into these kind of metaphysical, just like icebergs, mm -hmm. um, that are, you're going to run into the mystery card eventually <laughs> if you're going to retain your faith. But the reality of living incarnately, physically, socially, horizontally with other people who are groping through life, it's highs and lows, it's injustices yeah. and burdens, but also it's great elations and triumphs that you have to be wrestling with those questions from within that framework and not just as like, let me figure out if I can square this circle on mm -hmm. paper, you know, for my theology class, uh, because I wanted to rejoice with them mm -hmm. and signal to them. This was mm -hmm. an answer to prayer. And I didn't want to have to ask like, well, they later wonder, you know, why we were saying mm -hmm. that was an answer to prayer, but God didn't answer this prayer or whatever. I don't know if that, if you've ever had that thought about the challenge of like answered prayers. Yeah, I mean, I, I, a big part of my first paper on prayer is is this question, how can you know if this is actually an answer to prayer if or if this would have happened anyway? Right, yeah. Right? yeah. So, I mean, that's that's exactly. kind of the question at the back Dear of your God, mind. God, I hope there. I can drink this glass of water. <laughs> like, well, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, I mean, there, there are lots of puzzles here, but I do think that in certain cases, it's so clear that it is an answer to prayer, right? If it's something that you wouldn't expect in the normal course of things. like So, I, I give an example of my in my paper mm. about how um, my friend, um, she was a pastor's wife, had four young children, mm. and she had this whole year in which she was so fatigued. She couldn't even get out of bed, uh, and all these doctors couldn't figure it out. Eventually, um, they did an MRI on her brain, and they found that there was this tumor in the middle of her brain. Mm. And the doctor said, we don't even know if we could do anything about it that it may be inoperable, right? And so she sent out this blast email to everyone, her entire church, everyone across the country. And so we're just, you know, fervently praying for her. And within a few weeks, they did a follow-up MRI um, and found that, in fact, there was no tumor there left, and it was just a hole of fluid. Mm. And the doctors were like, we didn't even start treatment. We have no explanation for, the, for how this happened. Mm. And so, of course, my friend and uh, her husband, they looked at each other and it's like, this is clearly God's answer to prayer. So I think in those kinds of cases in which it seems like a miracle has happened. Like the doctors have no idea what happened. That seems like a really good candidate mm -hmm. for an answer to prayer. But, mm -hmm. but I, I, I do, I, I would grant that like for someone finding a, a, sure. a spouse, yeah. that happens fairly often. E-harmony. Right? Yeah, exactly. Day. So yeah, it's not exactly. something that would be as blatant, right? I mean, the, the, the thing that my I mind goes to is saying. like Elijah yeah. on Mount Carmel, right? Right. That seems like such a, you know, he's like, okay, whoever's God is the real God, let, let him answer Let's by fire, it. right? Yeah. And it's like, it's such a dramatic, miraculous kind of event that it's, it's, the people have no question. They're like, oh no, Yahweh, he's, he is God, right? Um, and so, but I think in the more everyday, quotidian type of mm. prayers, sometimes it is hard to, like, you know, these, this is like the most, most you know, quotidian. It's like, if you ask God, um, you're, in, you're in Manhattan or something like that, and you're praying for a parking spot or something, 
Like, and you find one. It's like, okay, would that have happened anyway? Or is that God answering the prayer or something like that? So I think there is, there is a real question there. But I think in certain other situations, um, it seems so clear mm-hmm. based on how unlikely it would be or the timing of it or something like that. Yeah. Like I've had situations in my life where I'm like, you know, God answers a prayer. I'm just like, wow. God is real. Mm-hmm. It's like such a dramatic kind of thing. But other times you're right. I think it's sometimes a little bit more difficult to discern. Mm. I think finding a parking spot in Manhattan was the most miraculous thing there, that you just mentioned. But. Do you guys know this SNL skit? Do you guys watch SNL? There's this old one with Sally Field, and I think it's Phil Hartman is Jesus. Mm. I mean, Phil Hartman should be Jesus. Like he's just like <laughs> such a great voice. But there's this uh, SNL skit where <laughs> <laughs> Sally Field is like, you know, this mother at home, the kids are off to school, and she's like, dear Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I hope that the, like, made, all these ridiculous asks, like, I hope they don't, I hope they're okay with the fact that I cut off the, the ends of their sandwiches, like the, the crusts are off and like, dear Jesus, help me to do that well. Help me to cut off these crusts well. And she's just, oh. I'm making that up. I forget what the actual things are, but she's asking all these, all these ridiculous things. Suddenly like, you know, smoke fills the room yeah, and yeah, Phil yeah. Hartman enters and he's Jesus. He's like, hey. <laughs> and basically he's like, it's really busy up there. <laughs> And it's just like, you're just asking a lot of really, <laughs> a lot of not so great things. Um, uh, uh, listen, sometimes wisdom, wisdom can sound like evasion. I, I, one of the things I think you're getting at is this idea of like, well, why pray? Mm-hmm, like at some mm-hmm. level we pray because I want something, I need something, yeah. I can't procure I can't get it myself. So I'm not going to ask someone who can, right? That's, if we're getting yeah. back to like this really base vision of prayer as petition, that's why. Why did you yeah, pray? Yeah. Because you needed something and you can't get it for yourself. Right. But that's not the only reason we pray, mm-hmm. right? Like that we pray because sometimes it's just really good to say out loud what it is you want. Mm. And by saying that out loud and putting that before the face of God, you get to see it through his eyes at best case scenario, mm-hmm. right? Like, oh, you know what? I really want that, but it's not, it's kind of an ugly thing. Or I really want that, and it's really tender and good, and I'm not convinced you're going to give it to me, Mm. but I will practice this crazy hope Mm. that you are the God who promises that you'll always be there for me. Yeah. That that actually, in the really cheap way of looking at that, is like, it's just good to ask. (laughs) But it is actually just really good to ask. Mm. That there's actually something incredibly, incredibly vulnerable informative mm. about consistently reminding yourself you're not God. Mm. Because if you were, you could have just done it for yourself. But instead, I want this precious thing, and I am not sure you will give it to me. But with the most faltering of faith, I can at least ask. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that, I think, is one of the more profound human acts that we can do. Yeah. And there's a way, like Sally, it's funny. That's a yeah. funny skit. <laughs> yeah. But this idea that we really the asking itself matters. Right. I, I thought something That's I emphasize good. a lot is that this prayer is in some sense, the good things that we're asking for is in some sense less of a good than the intimacy that prayer can bring about between you and God. Yeah. Because I don't think it's accidental when Jesus is talking about prayer in the Gospels. He's consistently talking about it's prayer to your father hmm. and your father comparing it Um, I mean, he sometimes does talk about the unjust judge, but the dominant analogy is which of you fathers Mm. would give to your children stone instead of bread, Mm. right? Or a serpent instead of fish, Mm. right? So that's the dominant metaphor. And I think it's not accidental. It's like this, like it's within the family relationships that we ask for even these little things. It's like, dad, mom, could I have this? Could I have that? And it's in that everyday, even in these quotidian things Mm -hmm. where it's like that relationship, it's a, like a consistent everyday right, kind right. of thing, right? It's asking in the context of relationship. Exactly. And Jesus, when he teaches them how to pray, it's not just father, it's Abba famously, yes, this really yes. intimate term. I think I've always thought Aladdin, the Disney movie is the most <laughs> theologically significant movie that my kids have watched because it's, it's just a great like farce parable on what it would be like if God answered every mm. prayer unequivocally when mm. you rub the bottle. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, this is back to your original question. <laughs> yeah. Things just go totally haywire. Right. When yeah. you actually get everything you want. And right. it's like that famous um, vignette in James K. Smith's you are what you love um, book, which I love is like, you don't actually want to go into that room. It's some Danish movie or something. I can't remember what it's called, but there's like a room that you go into. And um, if you went in there, you'd get everything that Mm. you want. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and it would be like the, the fear is like, actually don't know what I want. And I'm pretty sure if I got everything I wanted, it would go very badly for me. So there's a sense of that being a conversation with your parent, Mm -hmm. with your father, with Mm -hmm. your Abba that actually brings it into context. So let's, we've talked about what we've even talked about why and ways, why to pray, uh, in ways I didn't expect we'd talk about. It's really great, but let's finish with how, how do you pray? So there might be some people like me who hear a prayer and it's like, you've got these vignettes from youth camp of like the prayer warriors, you know, who stormed the gates of heaven from four to 7 AM every morning and did great things for God and led revivals. And that's great. And actually aspire to that still, but it also can be overwhelming. Like what are we even talking about when we talk Mm -hmm. about prayer and how would you maybe get it going? If you're thinking like, I don't pray at all or not much right now. Like how do you pray either personally or like traditional practices or what do you think? Well, I, I think it's, um, I think I, I talked a little bit about intimacy and relationship, mm-hmm. right? And like, I think the idea is that it should be something that's regular as opposed to trying to go for the marathon sessions, mm. right? So I think it's far better to pray every day, like five minutes than it is to pray like two hours on one day and not talk to God at all for like months, mm. right? Because I think that that's, I mean, it's just like physical training. You want to have a consistency to it. So that, um, so even if you start out small, it's something that b- becomes part of your everyday kind of life. Mm. So I think that that's where I would start, right, in saying that um, don't aim for the stars. Like with any other human practice, we start with baby steps and we start with just saying what's on our heart, uh, what we're struggling with, what, you know, our deepest, deepest longings and desires are. Um, but then also reflecting on, the ways in which we feel that God has spoken to us, whether it be through a sermon, through a Bible study, reading scripture, whatever it might be, and speaking to God um, in response to that. I think that those are like really simple ways to start, but if done on a regular basis, I think what begins to develop is the heart starts, our hearts start naturally calling out to God. Hmm. Uh, in the in a similar way that um, for people who are married, when something significant happens in our lives, almost the first person we want to talk to is our spouse, Mm -hmm. right? That evening or something like that saying, honey, this happened. I mean, whether it be big or small, Mm -hmm. it becomes almost like this habitual kind of like, I want to talk to her about this. Mm. Let's discuss this. I want to share this news with her or something like that, right? Mm. And I think that um, having that consistency of just a little bit of time, I think that develops that um, kind of natural hearts calling out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any other thoughts. Lindsay. Well, I would say overwhelming advice in the tradition Mm. is to pray often, Mm -hmm. honestly, and briefly, Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Like Mm -hmm. you should pray all the time. You don't need to save it till like Sunday mornings. It doesn't just have to happen at 10 PM. (laughs) Uh, You should pray all the time. You should, if you're going to pray, do it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like pray honestly, Mm -hmm. don't, don't go through the motions Mm -hmm. and then keep it brief. Like what are you giving the, you, you're like giving a novella, presenting a novella to God, like just say it, you know, move on. You've got things to do. There's lots of good things to do in life. You can't mm. spend the whole day praying. Mm-hmm. Um, so honestly, often and brief as is, is sort of an overwhelming advice mm-hmm. from the tradition. Mm-hmm. The other, this one I always love from Bart. Um, I think it's in his, uh, who cares where it's from, but Bart at some <laughs> point is, it's a little like the sassy side of Bart where he's just so good at reminding some of the basics. And he's like, mm. you know what prayer is? It's talking to God. Mm. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you say, you know, yeah. and this, I, this is, you know, calling on all you pastors, but when you're in church and someone says something like, let us pray. Mm-hmm. And then everyone across, yeah. you know, holds their hands and puts their head eyes down. And, and then you just repeat the sermon, <laughs> but slower. <laughs> and in a way that <laughs> reminds all of us to do what I just said. Like what you've done Ouch. is just deliver a sermon right, with yeah. your I mean, eyes sermon, closed. It's a very instructive quietly. sermon. Yeah, well, no, exactly. yeah, it's, yeah. it's not a prayer. Right. No. Because you weren't talking to God. It's a recapitulation. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's like of your if you yeah. if you are if you want to pray, then make sure you're talking to God. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's actually mm. just that can be like severe news, maybe for some folks, but it also is really good news. It so is. if you feel this pressure to do this performative mm kind of praying like, Oh, so-and-so is a really good prayer. I better sound like that. No, all you are tasked to do Mm. is pray to God. Mm. So don't talk to that, you know, person in the corner. Don't talk to a spiritual leader in the room. You're talking to God. Mm. And I would hope Mm. 
depending on your experience of that God, that that's actually really freeing Mm -hmm. instead of being terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I think it resonates with Jesus's thinking about prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Where it's like the religious people are right. really good at super long mm-hmm. prayers mm-hmm. and out in public spaces. Yeah, who are you talking to? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But he's, keep it simple, keep it brief. Here's how to pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. And he says, go in your closet. There's a kind of privacy mm-hmm. and that's the element of intimacy. I love that pray without ceasing. Um, there's often, it's honest, it's brief. Um I love their brother Lawrence wrote that little practicing the presence yeah. of God book, which seems to resonate Isaac with what you're saying. If you have your short pithy, but devoted time given mm. to talk to God, ideally at the beginning of your day, it sets you on a trajectory to be in conversation mm-hmm. with him where it becomes that sort of like second self-consciousness where it's, you're just talking to God throughout the day. And Anne Lamott, one of my favorite authors, her little book on prayer is simply titled help. Thanks. Wow. She says like, Mm -hmm. I don't know that much about God or that much about prayer, but I feel like keeping it brief, keeping it simple, keeping it Mm -hmm. direct. And there's three kinds of prayer there. The prayer of help, the prayer of thanks Mm -hmm. and the prayer of wow. And actually helped me too is the help prayers make a lot of sense, but the ask the gimme prayers. um, Yeah. You have to think through what you're always asking for. And yet, like you said, there's a childlikeness to saying something to God and putting it out loud that helps you maybe even see it from a different perspective. Okay. So there's a lot of reasons to pray. We now know what prayer is, why we should pray, how we might Mm. do it. Talk to God. Let's finish on this little zinger. What's the biggest thing you've ever prayed for? The biggest thing I've ever prayed for? Biggest. There's, there's been a lot. I mean, what, what oftentimes it's these life-threatening mm-hmm. prayers that are really big that mm-hmm. seem like true, like mountains to move, like, mm-hmm. you know, someone's dying of cancer or something like that. Those are huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'll give you a different example. Um, during um, our family's stay at, um, at Oxford for a postdoc, um, it was a very strange situation because my roommate um, was trying to adopt a, a, a child from the Congo. But the Congo government would refuse to let um, that child leave that country mm. uh, because they didn't want Americans to um, adopt children from the Congo for whatever reason. So he was legally adopted but could not leave the country. Mm. And so my my college roommate and his wife were so distraught over this. Um, simultaneously, my wife's college roommate, her brother, was being held as a prisoner by North Korea because he was convicted as being a secret Christian missionary Mm. in North Korea. So both of us, our roommates, had loved ones that were in these Mm. impossible situations in which these governments that were hostile to the United States would not let these people go. Mm. So I felt like this was like a double mountain. It's like, how (laughs) how could we even... And I felt that pressure that you were talking about with with your children, because... Laura and I were praying about this, and we were telling our children to pray with us about this, but we're like... What would happen if we're praying for these things consistently and neither of those people were able to be free Mm -hmm. from these situations? Like, this might wreck their faith. Mm -hmm. And they were very young at this point, like Mm -hmm. three or five or something like that. But it's funny because that, not funny, but like that whole year we were praying, these were huge things. Like, how could this even happen? Mm -hmm. But it's amazing that both of them were actually freed. Mm -hmm. And like now they're both not in the Congo and not in North Korea. And Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm very thankful to God that I didn't have to like wrestle with this question with my children. Mm. But like at the time that seemed like an impossible situation. Like how could this happen? Mm. Um, but, but God answered those prayers. So I, I'm thankful that at least those um, were in the category of answer. Answered. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Lindsay. I'll take the opposite tack. No. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you know, I'm at a stage in life and where a lot of people are getting married, having children. And I think some of my, how was it phrased? The biggest ask? Mm, Biggest ask. Yeah. It's around the people who are losing children. Mm -hmm. Either in the womb, Mm -hmm. right after. Mm -hmm. um, The horrific evils. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in that sense, largely unanswered, right? Or not the way I wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm. 
Well, since you asked, I'll say mine. Um, no, I, I was thinking about this this morning. We had our little guy, Wes, our trailer, our fourth kid, who's now two and a half, when he was six months old, he had this very weird cough uh, that he had to go to urgent care and then ER and get steroided up. And mm-hmm. it was super scary. It was some respiratory virus. Um, and we came out of it and we're just like, oh, thank God. And we kind of had that like let down on a Friday night mm-hmm. after Nora had spent the night in ER and... Um, and then it was like, we're just sitting around the table doing pizza, getting ready for a Disney movie and just feeling really grateful. And he stops breathing oh. at the table. Oh. And first and only time I ever called 911. And you kind of go into like an altered state of consciousness. I don't really remember it. I know I was crying out. Mm-hmm. I know I was saying help at least. And was just like on the brink of doing the high speed chase to the ER because the ambulance was taking too long. And then they got there and he gasped and it was an answer to prayer. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was physiologically going to happen anyway. I'll never know. You know, I'm happy to give thanks to God, but I do think that that was a foxhole prayer, you mm-hmm. know, but I do think there's something about that kind of primal honesty, which is it's beyond prayer. It's the cry for life. It's the cry for life over death, yeah. for well-being over sickness and evil. And I, that's that's bringing yourself to God. And I think we're doing it more often then we know. And I think what you said, Lindsay, just as something I'm going to hang on to is it's a both and ask on God's part for us in prayer. It is a bold, reckless cry uh, for things to go well, for the desires of our heart to be delivered from evil um, and to be forgiven and to forgive others. It also is simultaneously, and this doesn't diminish, it's not like a caveat, it's a simultaneous submission to God's will above our own. And I don't actually think we'll unwrap the mystery of how his Mm -hmm. will was being worked out in our lives or over time in history until we get there. And so that is the the mystery card, but played in the right way at the right time. It can actually help your faith, I think, and maybe your Mm -hmm. prayer life. So thank you guys so much today. It's been a great conversation. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. See you next time. This has been a production of George Fox Digital. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe to the George Fox Talks podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you stream things on your phone or computer. Check us out on the web at georgefox.edu slash talks, where we have videos, publications, and more. And we're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash georgefoxtalks. 